Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our AC Alliance Tuesday Talk. This webinar is being recorded. We are your moderators. My name is Rosie Finnegan, and I'm joined today by Sherilyn Adler. I am the parent of a 13-year-old daughter who is deaf and has been using cochlear implants since she was nearly three years old. She's in eighth grade, and she was the voice of Cece and El Devo for the Apple TV series based on the book El Devo by Cece Bell. So please check it out if you haven't already. I'm so pleased to be participating in today's call. Sherilyn, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, my name is Sherilyn Adler. I'm a licensed psychologist and educator from South Florida and the parent of a 27-year-old son who received his uh, cochlear implant way back in 1997. Um, I've been active in the hearing loss community for decades, and I volunteer for and consult with a lot of organizations related to hearing loss, and I currently serve as the executive director of Earpiece Save Your Hearing Foundation, which is an educational nonprofit dedicated to um, educating young people about the dangerous epidemic of noise-induced hearing loss and its prevention. Thanks. So this talk is part of an ongoing series for parents, adults with hearing loss, family members, and others. As members of ACI Alliance Advocacy Network, CICAN, or Cochlear Implant Consumer Advocacy Network, we hope you learn from the session and consider getting involved in the work of ACI Alliance. Next slide, please. First, let's review the technology and go over the Zoom settings that will help you. To access closed captioning, first click settings in the navigation panel at the top of the screen. Then under the meetings tab, verify that closed captioning is enabled. If not, click the toggle to enable it. To ask a question, please use the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen. Next slide, please. <laughs> American Cochlear Implant Alliance is a unique organization focused on CI care across the continuum. We were founded because it was felt that cochlear implants often fell through the cracks at other hearing health organizations, and we wanted to focus attention on improving access to CIs. The mission of the ACI Alliance is to support research, advance awareness, and advocacy. Next slide, please. CI can the CI Consumer Advocacy Network is for adult consumers and family members of recipients, including parents, aimed at enhancing and enlarging the broader efficacy efforts with firsthand knowledge of cochlear implants. Personal stories make the difference in impacting decision makers and adds credibility in our contacts with state and federal representatives on key issues. If you're interested in learning more, please let us know in the chat box and ACI Alliance staff will follow up with you later. Next slide, please. We also wanted to share a few of the ACI Alliance website resources that are available. Next slide. And now we are delighted to introduce our featured speakers today. Kelly Nichols Starr is a speech language pathologist and certified auditory verbal therapist, listening and spoken language specialist. She has been at Michigan Medicine's cochlear implant program since 2006. Kelly is co-principal investigator of Michigan Medicine's sound support outreach grant supported by the state of Michigan and the University of Michigan Department of Otolaryngology, providing outreach and lectures to educational professionals in the state of Michigan. Casey Stack is an audiologist who has worked on various cochlear implant programs for the past 33 years. She has been part of the cochlear implant program at the University of Michigan since 2004 and has specialized in pediatric and adult clinical practice. She has been a member of the American Cochlear Implant Alliance since 2012 and an ACIA state champion since 2013. Welcome, and I will turn the presentation over to you guys. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, my name is Casey Stack. Um, and I, along with Kelly, are very honored to be here to present on this topic today. Um, we're gonna dive right in and talk about when your child is diagnosed with hearing loss and you have been told that hearing aids may not provide appropriate benefit to develop spoken language and you've been referred for a cochlear implant evaluation. And that can be a very stressful time and it's very normal to have a variety of feelings and unanswered questions. This presentation is gonna walk you through how we test babies and young children and determine if they're a cochlear implant candidate. I'm gonna focus on the uh, audiometric evaluation and then I'm gonna pass it over to Kelly who will talk about the speech and language component. So how do we go from diagnosing a hearing loss to recommending a cochlear implant? It begins with the diagnosis of hearing loss, um, be that at the newborn hearing screening, which was mandated in 1999, or it could be later, as we know hearing loss can be acquired after birth. If diagnosed at birth, we do strive for the early hearing detection and intervention goals of having all infants screened, um, no later than one month of age, preferably before discharge from their birthing hospital. And then all infants who refer on their screening have a full diagnostic hearing evaluation by three months of age. Then all infants with hearing loss are fit with hearing aids no later than six months of age and enrolled in an early intervention program. This um, has led to earlier diagnosis and earlier intervention, which is really crucial for language development as well as better counseling for parents and caregivers so they can make an informed choice on intervention. So per the FDA, we can implant children as young as nine months of age. Um, if your child has been diagnosed with significant hearing loss in the severe to profound range, we do know that hearing aids typically do not provide enough auditory information, even with the most powerful hearing aids to develop spoken language, if that is the goal. For most babies and children, several visits are scheduled to obtain all the information, and this can be done prior to nine months of age um, because it's important to gather information so that we can proceed with a cochlear implant, hopefully before their first birthday. The evaluation typically begins with um, a case history, um, and then we proceed pretty quickly to audiometric testing in conjunction with the speech and language evaluation. We do want to ensure that their hearing aid fitting um, is appropriate and we do hearing aid verification testing. And then if possible, we do attempt some aided uh, testing if the child is able to do that. They will also see a cochlear implant surgeon for a medical evaluation, including imaging. And then we proceed with insurance authorization. So how do you test a baby? So for infants under five to six months of age, we typically use what are called objective measures or measures that do not require a response from the infant. Um, the three tests that you see here, tympanometry, auditory brainstem response testing, and autoacoustic emission testing are safe, effective measures that can definitively tell us if a hearing loss is present. Tympanometry is a test where a probe is placed in um, the entrance of the ear canal and air is pushed into the ear canal, ear canal to determine if the eardrum or tympanic membrane is moving. On the top graph, you'll see um, as air is pushed into the ear and then pulled out of the ear canal, we see this nice peak of mobility indicating that the eardrum is moving back and forth normally. And then on the bottom graph, we just see a flat line indicating that the eardrum cannot move. And this is typically suggestive of fluid in the middle ear cavity. We need a normal outer and middle ear in order to do ABR and OAE testing. So it's very important to perform this test prior to proceeding with those tests. Auditory brainstem response testing can be done at any age. Um, this is where electrodes are placed uh, behind the ears and little insert earphones are placed in the ear canal and they deliver an auditory signal. The electrodes are actually measuring the ear and brain's response to sound. 
And we're looking for brain waves or the peaks that you see all on these top images, what we call waves one through five. If we don't see these peaks, even at high intensity levels, like you see on the bottom graph, um, we determine that hearing loss is present and we can even determine the severity of that hearing loss. Otoacoustic emissions are another objective measure we use in conjunction with ABR testing. It also involves putting a probe in the baby's ear canal and a stimulus is presented. And we're measuring a response that comes back from the outer hair cells of the inner ear. So on the left side of the screen, you'll see what we call a normal OAE, which is um, these lines that are uh, either in the middle of the graph or at the top of the graph. And on the right-hand side, you see that there's no response to uh, an OAE. It is important to note that these tests should be used in conjunction with one another to confirm if hearing loss exists, and also it helps determine where the hearing loss is coming from. So if significant hearing loss exists from birth, this is the progression we typically strive for if spoken language is the goal of the family. We know there's a critical period for developing spoken language, which is between birth and three years of age. So the earlier we implant, the better the outcome is going to be. We can gather information prior to nine months of information to confirm candidacy, and then hopefully proceed um, once they reach um, nine months to one year. So diagnosis, as we talked about, can happen between one and three months. The hearing aid fitting can happen uh, anywhere between three and six months. We can begin discussing um, the possibility of a cochlear implant as early as one month if we know significant hearing loss exists. Um, we will be gathering data from four to nine months and then hopefully proceeding with insurance authorization so that surgery can be scheduled. If a child is not diagnosed um, at birth with hearing loss and they've passed their newborn hearing screening or acquired hearing loss, um, later, the evaluation can look a little different. Um, a referral can come from uh, an audiologist, a speech pathologist, a parent, um, the primary care physician, um, or even school professionals who are concerned that hearing loss may exist. And then the child will be evaluated by the audiologist and the speech language pathologist. And we will determine if the child is making good progress with their hearing aids. And if they are, then great. We will just continue to monitor those children. If not, then um, we will proceed with the cochlear implant evaluation and refer them to the cochlear implant surgeon for the medical evaluation, and then proceed with insurance authorization and schedule surgery. So how do you test a child? If a child is five to six months of age or older, we can begin to test hearing what we call subjectively in a sound booth by obtaining what's called an audiogram. We use this in conjunction with the objective measures um, that we discussed earlier. And when we do put a child uh, in the booth and have them participate in testing, we are plotting hearing aid hearing on a graph called an audiogram. We're trying to determine the softest uh, level at which they can hear a stimuli, and we call that threshold. An audiogram plots frequency or pitch across the top, so low pitch on this side, high pitch on this side, and this represents a loudness level in decibels, very, very soft to very, very loud. When we test hearing subjectively, we do it two ways. Um, we do it by air conduction and bone conduction. Air conduction transmits the signal through the entire auditory system from the outer to the middle to the inner ear, and it provides information regarding um, the conductive and sensory neural systems of the ear. When we test bone conduction, we are bypassing the outer and middle ear and we're placing an oscillator on the mastoid bone behind uh, the ear and it provides information regarding um, the sensory neural system only. And this is just what it looks like when we're testing um, by air conduction. We might be using these little inserts in their ears or you might see typical headphones. And this is the little bone oscillator that we put behind on the mastoid bone to vibrate the skull to test the inner ear directly. 
If hearing loss is in the outer or the middle ear, we call that a conductive hearing loss in the outer or middle ear. If the hearing loss is uh, in the inner ear or in the cochlea, we call that a sensory neural hearing loss. And if they have combination of something going on in their outer or middle ear and their inner ear, we call that a mixed hearing loss. Children who are cochlear implant candidates um, have a sensory neural hearing loss. Conductive hearing losses are losses that typically can be um, corrected possibly by surgery or medicine. If you have a middle ear infection, um, once that middle ear fluid clears up, the hearing comes back. Um, it, when it is sensory neural, that's not the case. That is a permanent hearing loss. So here are just some examples of what can cause a sensory neural hearing loss versus a conductive hearing loss. Um, most often babies are born with congenital hearing loss of either a known or unknown cause. Um, genetics or hereditary components can play a factor. We're all gonna lose our hearing as a result of aging, which is the number one cause of hearing loss. But you can also have um, conductive hearing losses where you might have middle ear fluid, a foreign object in the ear, uh, ear canal, a ruptured eardrum, and you can have a combination of, of those which will cause a mixed hearing loss. So not only does the audiogram tell us where the hearing loss is coming from, but we can determine the severity of the hearing loss as well. There is a range of hearing loss, which you see here. Responses when we test them in the booth, if they are 25 decibels or below in this range here, that is considered the range of normal hearing. And then the hearing, um, you can have a mild all the way down to a profound hearing loss. So this is just an example of an audiogram um, exhibiting normal hearing. We typically plot the right ear with a circle and the uh, left ear with an X. And you can see from low pitch to high pitch, all of the responses are 25 decibels or below. So this is an audiogram of someone who has normal hearing. If there is a problem, as I said, in the external or middle ear, the patients will have um, normal bone conduction, indicating that their sensory, uh, their inner ear is functioning normally, but there is something going on in the outer or middle ear causing a mild hearing loss, and you'll see this um, air bone gap. This is what an audiogram would look like if there was a problem in the inner ear. We see that their air conduction and their bone conduction scores are um, very close to one another or within 10 decibels of each other. And this is an example of someone who has a mild sloping to a moderate to severe hearing loss. And then here is an example of a mixed hearing loss. So there's something going on in the outer ear or middle ear as well as the inner ear. So they have a, uh, mild uh, um, sensory hearing loss. You can see their bone scores are not in the normal range, but um, their air conduction scores are worse. And we have a little bit of an air bone gap here indicating a mixed hearing loss. Hearing loss can be progressive. So we need to monitor these children very closely. Um, children with mild hearing losses um, can present as if they have normal hearing, but can have significant challenges in the presence of background noise. And we do know that classrooms are very, very noisy. Um, they may miss part of the word or the parent might, might think they have some selective hearing. These are typically hearing losses that should be aided with hearing aids. And we need to ensure that, um, that there are no speech and language uh, issues. With a moderate hearing loss without amplification, children will miss 50 to 75% of spoken conversation. Um, if they are fit with amplification, they should be able to hear fairly well in most situations. And again, the speech and language would be continued to be monitored to ensure that there's no delays. With a moderate to severe hearing loss, we do start to think about um, if a cochlear implant might be in this child's future. Um, Hearing aids still might provide enough benefit, but they are going to be monitored very, very closely. And then when it falls into the severe hearing loss range, they're most likely a cochlear implant candidate. And with a profound hearing loss, we do know that children with profound hearing losses who receive a cochlear implant outperform uh, children with profound losses who just use hearing aids. A quick note on what we call single-sided deafness. Uh, Single-sided deafness is when a child has normal hearing in one ear, and you can see the normal hearing in the right ear on this audiogram, 
and a profound hearing loss in the other ear. In 2019, the Food and Drug Administration approved cochlear implants for uh, SSD, and these children should be considered for some type of intervention, as we know that we hear better with two ears than we do with just one. In fact, those children with unilateral hearing loss are 10 times like uh, 10 times greater risk for academic failure than children with normal hearing in both ears. So here's just the side-by-side um, the -side view of an audiogram of someone with normal hearing versus a child who might be a candidate for a cochlear implant with their thresholds in that severe to profound range. So how do you get a nine-month-old baby or a three-year-old child to respond to sound in a booth? <clears throat> From birth to six months of age, as I've said, the objective testing is going to be the most important. We sometimes can um, do what is called behavioral observational audiometry, but the reliability with this test can vary. And we do uh, put more emphasis on the objective measures. When children are about six months of age to about two and a half years of age, we can use something called visual reinforcement audiometry which we'll talk about in a second. And then when they're uh, about two to three years of age, VRA becomes a little um, not as exciting. And so we transition them to something called conditioned play audiometry. Visual reinforcement or VRA is just when we, uh, we teach a child that when they hear a stimulus to actually turn and a little video monitor will light up. We are visually rewarding for them when they uh, respond to sound. So we teach them to do that. And we can do this pretty easily with um, insert earphones um, when, they're, when they're little. This is um, just what a typical setup would look like when we're testing someone um, using VRA. We like to put our babies in a high chair. Um, this little one has insert earphones. Um, this is David. He's a test assist. So he sits in front of the, the baby and um, distracts uh, the baby so they don't stare at the, at the video. Mom's just off to the side. And um, sh the baby is taught when they hear, they will turn their head and the video monitor will light up. As I said, once they get a little bit older, the VRA becomes a little less exciting. And so we teach them to do what's called a conditioned response. So and we teach children to just hold an object or a toy to their ear. And when they hear the stimulus, then they can put the toy in, uh, in whatever. So here's a little boy using a pegboard. We can use puzzles, um, really anything that allows them to put an object into a container. If a child has some language preoperatively um, due to a progressive loss, for example, we will attempt some aided um, speech perception or speech recognition testing with appropriately fitted hearing aids. Typical tests for cochlear implant can candidacy are um, words and sentences, and we're trying to determine how much they understand without visual cues. So these are typically um, presented as a recording through a speaker. Testing may be performed in quiet and in noise, um, and the cochlear implant center also might uh, perform individual ear testing to determine if they have a better uh, hearing ear. Prior to performing speech recognition testing, we do verify whether the patient's hearing needs are fit appropriately. We do this by placing a probe microphone in the ear canal and we can measure the output um, of the hearing aid at the eardrum. Um, we use um, tests uh, or targets and algorithms that these hearing needs are programmed to to ensure that they're meeting targets as best they can. We do know that hearing needs do have limitations. One significant one is that um, hearing aids typically only amplify out to about 4,000 hertz and cochlear implants can go out to 8,000 hertz. So we're providing um, sometimes double or even triple the frequency boundaries um, of what a patient is getting with their hearing aids. So at our center, many of our pediatric patients are actually referred directly to the cochlear implant program for candidacy testing prior to meeting with the surgeon. Um, either way is appropriate. Other centers, the patient might actually start with the, the cochlear implant surgeon and then head over to the audiologist and speech pathologist. Um, this slide just summarizes the testing that or, or who is responsible for what um, type of testing. Um, 
And I'm going to hand it over to Kelly Starr to talk about the speech and language evaluation. Thank you, Casey. So just as Casey and I are swapping seats here, I think it shows just how our relationship is when working with a patient through the candidacy process. At our program, the speech pathologist on the cochlear implant team are housed with the audiologists. So it creates this specialty care for children and families going through candidacy. Okay, so in recent years, speech and language evaluations have changed and it is that we are seeing children at younger and younger ages due to newborn hearing screening, um, following the Eddie goals, and also the lowering of age of implantation. And so we have these babies who may be only a few months old, which is fantastic, and little to no access to sound. You might be thinking that a speech and language assessment may be a quick process, but in a reality, there's a lot that we are assessing and a lot more that we are discussing with families, um, more than just the testing. So I hope today when I have this door here, I'm kind of like opening the door and letting you in to see what happens during one of our speech and language evaluations for cochlear implantation. So at our program, we have three speech language pathologists who are also certified auditory verbal therapists and or listening and spoken language specialists. And what that is, is a specialty certification in addition to being a speech language pathologist for working with children who are deaf and hard of hearing. And um, you, I put this in here because you may have numerous professionals working with your child. There may be even another speech pathologist um, on the child's team, which is an important uh, team member for your child. But in addition to that, um, we have a listening and spoken language specialist on the team. If you want more information about specialists in your area, you can go to the AG Bell website and um, search by state. We also do a review of the case history, and uh, this gives us an opportunity to talk about the medical history. We use a team approach, so we're talking with the audiologist to discuss where they are at in the candidacy process. We're usually coming in after um, you've been seen by audiology for some appointments. And I put this little picture here because in my mind, it signifies how um, the process is the relationship between speech and audiology during the candidacy process where audiology is really holding most of the weight. And um, conversely, that post activation or post cochlear implantation, that distribution is a little bit more evenly uh, distributed because we are recommending weekly auditory verbal or listening and spoken language therapy. So it kind of shifts, but in this pre-op process, um, audiology is taking on most of the weight, but the fact remains we need both. So for one reason a speech and language evaluation is needed is that many states require it for authorization for cochlear implantation, but also this information is essential to gather baseline data. We know that we, um, we need to know where we are to know where to go next, and it will help us provide a treatment plan for your child. It gives us that baseline information for also for future comparisons. So post-activation of a cochlear implant, it's the comparison to that to monitor progress. And again, just as Casey said with audiology, how do we test babies? And my response is um, maybe a little more simple and it's to interact and play with the babies. And we, during that assessment, will be singing, using books, playing with toys, and it's all important work and gives us important information. Don't worry though, if your child's fussy or tired and uh, maybe just not themselves. And we also rely on parent report and questionnaires to give us information as well. So for the population, this birth to three years, um, there are several different areas we're targeting in our evaluations, starting with audition. So we're observing the child and seeing if there's any reactions to sound. Are they reacting to voice? Are they responding to sounds in their environment? At home, do they respond to maybe 
um, somebody's voice um, over somebody else's voice? Are they um, startling to any sounds? And this is something that we monitor over time as well. Um, then we have whoop, receptive language. So here, receptive language is the understanding of language. So do they comprehend the meaning of the sounds uh, that they have? So are they able to identify items? Do they recognize their name? Do they know that the barking of the dog is linked to the dog? Um, then we have expressive language or their use of language. How are they using their voice and gestures to communicate their needs and desires? We then have speech and voice. How is their vocal quality? And what, are, what speech sounds are they saying? So they laugh, do they hum? Are they making um, varied pitch variations? And all of these little things are really important uh, information for us to record and to know what they're hearing. Gestures and play. So here we know that children should be using at least two new gestures each month, each month between nine and 16 months. And if you want a resource for this, check out the, um, the First Words Project, 16 Gestures by 16 Months, and it's a great handout. So you may be thinking that this is, <laughs> and even how is play linked in? And play and gesture are really important indicators for us in knowing not just about their development, but also cognition. So it's really giving us a lot of valuable information. We use a variety of criterion reference tests or checklists, and then also standardized tests. And they provide us with some different results. We have raw scores, standard scores, and age equivalents. So as clinicians, we're looking at these scores for baselines. A raw score provides us with the total number of correct items. Standard score gives us an, um, a range. If they're between 85 and 115, they're in the average range when compared to peers with typical hearing. And then also we have age equivalents. So that would be they're in the six to nine month range. We talk how we hear. So therefore it's extremely important information to gather about the sounds being produced by your child. With typical hearing, we hear sounds, we process them or modify them, and then we say them. If we don't hear the sounds clearly, we aren't able to process and modify that and therefore unable to produce it. Babies, when initially they start to babble and for those first four months, they're using their muscles and um, mouse to coordinate the movements and produce. It's kind of like their practice. And after this, they continue to babble, but now they're modifying it based on the output. So if they're not hearing that, they're not able to modify based on output. Again, this is just another piece of important information uh, for us to gather. So even if we're asking what types of sounds that you're hearing, it's really important for us to note those. Then there's beyond the testing, and it's a lot of discussion. So beyond testing, we are asking um, about the activation. We're talking about activation and the discussion that we have to teach sound to be important and meaningful. It's not innate for a child who's never heard all the sounds of speech to have understanding. So we have to go through that progression or that hierarchy of listening, starting with detection which is just the understanding that sound is present um, and work our way up through understanding or comprehension. And they need that consistent and repeated auditory exposure for them to get to comprehension. And during this time, we're also talking about weekly listening and spoken language therapy, which is something that we recommend for post-activation so we can go through these stages. Even during this first assessment, I um, spend time talking about the first hurdle after activation as device use. And I really wanna prepare families for understanding what's to come after activation. Um, and 
I've seen that th this can be a struggle in thinking about the ways that we can reach full-time use. We know that consistent device use is just as impactful as age of implantation. So we wanna start this conversation now. To think about hearing is um, to think about letting sound in, as Casey mentioned, that birth to three we know is the critical window for auditory brain development. If we um, provide sound with a cochlear implant during that time, we are developing those auditory pathways um, and providing sound to the brain for understanding of listening and talking. So we need to also discuss making a plan for communication. Different paths lead to different destinations. So we have to have that plan to know where we wanna go. We discuss the communication options and when it comes down to it, any of them are work. So we just need to have a plan of what the family wants and moving forward with that goal in place. Um, we also know that many times as we gain more information about a child or when we're further down a path that that plan may change and we may need to move to a different option. The five most common communication options are auditory verbal or listening and spoken language. We have auditory oral, um, total communication, cued speech and sign language and um, I need to give credit to my colleague, Ellen Thomas, for um, this idea of how to put these on the continuum with this visual. I think it's great to, to show um, the listening and spoken language is more auditory focused and then going down the continuum that sign language is more visual. And then in between, we have the auditory oral, oral total communication which is the combination of listening and visual communication and then cued speech, which is a um, option where there are hand um, movements and um, forms by the mouth to signify different sounds that are being said in combination with spoken language. And the most important thing here is that we are providing a language rich environment for your child. So, once a communication option is selected, then we can make the plan for that. For children coming to us beyond those first years of life, um, that birth to three range, once we get to two and a half and older, we can start to do some more standardized testing. And this may be look more like picture pointing, um, interacting with the clinician. Um, and we are looking at voice, articulation, vocabulary. So at the word level, how are they understanding things? Then language, are they understanding longer pieces of information? And like at the sentence level, expressive language, how are they using the language that they have? Listening comprehension, are they following directions and instructions? And where's the breakdown happening? And then also literacy. And if we don't have if the child does not have access to all of the sounds of speech, we are gonna see some of these, um, see that show up in the speech and language evaluation. Here I have the speech banana and the, and the green bean. So uh, Casey uh, already explained the audiogram to us, but from a speech and language perspective, I always like to review the speech banana. And we have here again, just going from left to right, the frequency, so low all the way up to high and then quiet to loud. And then you see all the letters in like a banana looking shape on here. And that's where all the sounds for spoken English are on the audiogram. Now at the top there, you see also the green bean. And we not only wanna provide access within the speech banana, we wanna provide it at the top. We wanna make sure that the your child has access and clarity to all the sounds of spoken language so that they can develop and understand and have intelligible speech. Um, as Casey mentioned, we also will do evaluations for children with SSD. And when a child comes in for speech and language evaluation, oftentimes they will be coming in the average range during that assessment. And um, 
it's still not that they they might not be a candidate, but um, during that time, we're pushing it back to audiology to do some harder testing because they have a good ear to bring them along. Uh, so we have that audible, which is I can hear something is there versus intelligible, which is I understand and it's clear. So if you think back to that audiogram, we want to have that green bean at the top. Okay, so lastly, I always feel like in my appointments, a lot of times families are asking, what can we do now? We're in this pre-op process, what should we be working on? Um, even if my child doesn't have access to all of the sounds for listening and talking. And there are a lot of things to work on. So to start vocalizations, we want to make sure that if they are using um, babble and they're they're making sound that we encourage that and um, encourage them to continue to use their voice so that those don't diminish when they can't hear themselves using it. We want to introduce learning to listen sounds or sound object associations. So like the cow goes moo, um, the cars beep beep, and the telephones ring ring, hello. Um, all of these fun sounds that we connect to objects, we start to do in play. And again, they're not hearing all of those sounds that you're producing, but we are putting motions to them. We're using specific toys. We're interacting and showing that this is all really important so that when they do get access to sound, that's the last missing piece. And we do that same thing again so that it's not all new. They have that knowledge of, oh, I see now. Now that I understand that that's what you were doing with the cow. Um, gestures, again, uh, we want to incorporate that and continue to support the development of gestures when they're at this age. Books, we wanna read daily and um, do a lot of pointing, turn taking um, with the pages, helping them turn the pages, um, have them on your lap and read those books that all sound like, like you're singing a song, like brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? Um, and even if they're not hearing all that we're saying, we again are laying that foundation that the book is important, we're pointing to objects, we're talking closely to the child's ear. Um, and they're also feeling those vibrations if they're on your lap or in, the, in your chest, but you know when you're taking breaths. And again, this is really important information for us. Um, and then lastly, music, and that we can sing songs that's fun and engaging. We put motions to them, like it's a bitsy spider. And laying again that, that foundation that we can set them to be successful with the device. So we have this amazing piece of technology and there is a lot that influences outcomes. And we just spend this assessment talking about not just, um, not just assessing the child's language and listening, but also reviewing all these other pieces that go into it as well. And at that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Casey to close us out. Okay. <clears throat> so um, once a family has decided to proceed with a cochlear implant, um, we do discuss, um, which device and accessory options the family would like to go with. There are um, three FDA approved devices in the United States. Your cochlear implant audiologist or team will help guide you and counsel you on uh, the ones that they work with and um, to assist in determining which one would be appropriate um, for your child. Um, the internal devices you can see look very uh, similar. They all have um, a magnet um, and a computer chip or receiver stimulator here, and then an electrode array um, on the end. Um, I often get the question, which one is the best? And I can tell you they all perform um, equally and what they will all hear with regardless of which device you choose. It's really okay to choose a device based on the ease at which your child's going to wear it um, and you would be able to um, maintain it. Um, they do offer different styles. You'll see a behind the ear option here. 
um, for each manufacturer. And then there is an off the ear manufacturer or off the ear processor um, offered by a couple of the manufacturers. Um, and it is the, the family's choice. Um, some states, Michigan is a one processor state. So when a patient is implanted, they actually get one processor per ear. There are other states where um, they get a backup for their ear and, and you would need to discuss this with your audiologist uh, because it, it does vary uh, depending on which state you live in. All of the cochlear implant systems um, have very similar features. Um, these are some of the features that you there are aware of or will become aware of if you have a child um, who receives a cochlear implant. One of the things that we really look at every time they come in for programming is what we call data logging. And we can actually tell how many hours a day the child is actually wearing their device. Um, as Kelly mentioned, she talks about this preoperatively um, to prepare them. I think it's one of the biggest challenges we have. It's easy for um, us as providers to tell families your child needs to wear it full time. If their eyes are open, their implants should be on. Um, but toddlers and infants and uh, have sometimes have a mind of their own. So um, we use this tool to help assist the parent in figuring out how their child can keep their devices on so that they're hearing appropriately. They all come with apps that can be downloaded on, on a smartphone to be used as a remote control and ha oftentimes have troubleshooting built into them so that parents can um, tell how if the battery is working or if parts of the processors are not working, the apps will typically tell them um, up until the time the child can verbally report it's not working. They are all uh, allowed Bluetooth streaming. And so I have lots of uh, teenagers who connect their devices to their gaming systems. Um, all of my young, young children and, and teenagers stream music directly to their implants. Um, they have aqua sleeves, so you can go swimming with your cochlear implants if you choose to. They have um, rechargeable batteries, um, and they do come with wireless accessories. For example, remote microphones that the parents can use in noisy situations, as well as TV streamers. Um, and they all have um, FM uh, or Roger technology that can be used with them, which is a, a remote mic system that is typically used once they hit uh, school age. So there are these important factors should be discussed with your audiologist and your cochlear implant surgeon. Um, and the best device for each recipient depends on several factors. And really the most important is um, what the family is going to feel most comfortable with. Um, but these are some of the ish things that we do discuss with our families when they come in and um, are deciding on uh, which cochlear implant system to go with. Surgery. Um, typically last two to three hours. Most of our children get bilaterally implanted. There are occasions where they only receive one and the surgery might be uh, shorter. Um, our children are activated approximately two to four weeks after their surgery. Um, and then they come in approximately six times, five to six times within the first year um, for reprogramming or what we call remapping to fine tune the device and to ensure that they're hearing appropriately. Um, we typically start uh, measuring outcomes at six months post and then annually thereafter um, because we want to uh, monitor their progress and ensure that they're, um, they're hearing as well as they can. Kelly mentioned that our pediatric population does attend weekly speech therapy here at our center um, until they are age appropriate. And the hope is if they are implanted early and they develop um, speech and language normally that they would start in their mainstreamed kindergarten setting. So there are factors that do affect performance. Um, as we've already discussed, the age of implantation um, and the age of identification of the hearing loss are the two most critical uh, pieces that affect performance. Um, cochlear anatomy um, can also have an effect on performance. It's why imaging is so important when you meet with your cochlear implant surgeon. We want to ensure that the cochlea is uh, formed normally. If it is not, it does not mean that the child cannot get a cochlear implant. It just means that we need to counsel that family a little bit differently based on the anomaly. Um, Kelly discussed the participation in post-op speech therapy, and we cannot drive home um, enough the importance of consistent device use. Uh, things to know. Um, 
sometimes I, I hear providers or professionals say, oh, you know, try everything and, and a cochlear implant will be the last resort. I, we try not to talk about cochlear implantation as a last resort. We talk about it as an important next step. If the hearing aids are not doing the job, what are your options? And, and we live in an amazing time where this amazing technology exists and um, it is there for those families that choose to pursue it. Um, I often hear sometimes that, you know, I'm nervous because it's brain surgery. It is not brain surgery. The device doesn't come close to the brain. Um, the, the electrode array is placed in the cochlea and the magnet and the receiver are um, just tucked under the muscle behind um, the, under, on the mastoid. So, um, and we do know that if a child receives a cochlear implant early enough, they have a very good chance of developing normal spoken language skills. So some of the other questions I get um, preoperatively with some of the families is, um, can my child have an MRI? Um, yes, they can. Uh, when cochlear implants were first um, developed and approved by the Food and Drug Administration, um, they were um, not MRI compatible, but they have um, changed significantly. And now all three manufacturers have an MRI compatible magnet. Um, can my child play sports? Yes, I have children that play pretty much every imaginable sport. Um, uh, and if it requires a helmet, they typically just modify the helmet so um, they can play while wearing their speech processors. Can my child sleep with my their cochlear implants on? Um, sometimes, you know, oftentimes we tell families you'll take them off when they go to sleep or when they jump in the shower. Um, but I do have many families where the children re uh, refuse to take them off when they go to bed. So the family, the parents do allow, or caregivers do allow their children to go to sleep with them on. And then once they're asleep, the parents will go in um, and take the processors off to uh, recharge the battery and then put them on when they uh, wake up. Can your child swim with a cochlear implant? Yes, they do, as I mentioned, have aqua sleeves that they can slide their processors into. We believe it's a safety issue and they should be able to hear um, when they're around water. And so um, um, all, all of our kids use their aqua sleeves regularly. Can your child go through airport security? Yes, in fact, the TSA recommends that when you have hearing loss and are using hearing aids or cochlear implant technology that you actually leave your devices on and go through security um, while wearing them. They don't want you to take them off. Um, can my child play a musical instrument? Yes, we have children who are in marching band, um, play every mu every instrument that you can think of, um, and um, they enjoy music um, very much. So how do you find a cochlear implant center? You can go to the American Cochlear Implant Alliance website, and you can just click on that link that says find a cochlear implant clinic, and a little uh, map will come up. And you can um, click on the state that you live in and find a cochlear implant center um, closest to your home. And I would just like to thank and acknowledge the University of Michigan cochlear implant team. Um, I work with an amazing group of people and um, I'm very thankful every day to, uh, to work and share this um, important uh, job that we do. So I am going to... Uh, hand it back to our moderators, and we are certainly open to any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Casey and Kelly, for that wonderful presentation. If you have a question, please remember to submit it in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We do have a couple questions. Uh, Kelly, the first one is for you. Is there a certain self-reported questionnaire that you recommend parents use to document their children's progress? Um, not typically. I, there are several um, there are several scales out there that you can kind of monitor your child's development through. I can think of one through um, hearing first. And if you, I, I think it's just called scales of development. And it does break it down into those different areas of audition, receptive language, expressive language, speech, and I think cognition and play, I can't remember all the categories, but it would be a way that you could kind of track and, and see um, the age ranges and the expected um, areas for those, um, for those areas. Okay, thank you. 
And Casey, this question is for you. I know some parents of children with a severe to profound or maybe even a moderate to, to severe loss struggle with the decision as whether to stay with hearing aids or go for the cochlear implant. You mentioned that kids with CIs outperform those with hearing aids with this level of loss. Can you elaborate on that for a moment? Um, yes, I think, you know, Kelly mentioned this when she was talking um, about the speech and language portion is, you know, it's all about the clarity of the signal. Um, and if you are using hearing aids or if your child is using hearing aids um, and they have significant hearing loss, hearing aids are just acoustic amplifiers and they are sending the signal from the outer to the middle to the inner ear through a damaged auditory system, um, which is why they have hearing loss. The cochlear implant is going to bypass the damaged part of the cochlea and stimulate the auditory nerve correctly. So um, the important component is to really have your child evaluated um, with appropriately fitted hearing aids to, to see how much they're actually hearing and understanding with um, their implant, um, or I'm sorry, with their hearing aids. So, and if they're not, um, you know, sometimes I, I see, I'll see families say, well, they're getting 50% on sentence recognition. Um, but I look at that as they're, they're missing 50% of what people are saying. And so um, as long as you have in, you know, the information and the data to help you make an informed decision, that's the goal of the cochlear implant team. Our team is not to convince you to, to make this choice for your child. Our job is to really provide you with all the information so that you can make an informed decision so they, they can succeed um, especially academically. And as we know, um, you know, it, it gets incredibly challenging, not only academically, but with the signal to noise ratio in these classrooms. Um, classrooms are super noisy. And so we need these kids to hear the best that they can in, in, in their academic environment. Thank you. Um, another question, can you speak to the importance of ongoing testing in order to be able to advise where uh, language therapy needs to go next? Yeah, so with listening and spoken language therapy, our sessions are diagnostic in nature. And so if we're seeing a child on a weekly basis, we are during those sessions tracking their progress. But in addition to that, we do formal evaluations every six months. And during those time periods, we have that baseline data for comparison, and we um, are using that to chart out what their progress is during that six months time. So at a minimum, we would expect six months and six months time, six months of progress in six months time. And if we're not making that, um, and we're hoping for more if they're in intervention, but if they're not making that, that's um, then a time to discuss what treatment plan or treatment options or communication mode that we might, might need to be doing. Perfect. And, and one last question, because we're running up on our time period. Um, and you may have answered this a little bit earlier, but perhaps you could clarify. We have a question that wants to know about how the language acquisition window is affected for um, single-sided deaf kids. Yeah, um, maybe, maybe Kelly can... Um answer this as well. Um, these are challenging kids. And as you know, um, prior to newborn screening, children who were born with unilateral hearing loss or single-sided deafness, oftentimes their hearing loss was not diagnosed until they hit kindergarten. And they had a hearing screening and they realized that they had hearing loss in one ear. Um, I think years ago, the thought was, oh, you have one normal ear, you're gonna do, you're gonna do fine. You've developed speech and language normally and you're, you're gonna, you're fine. Um, but we know, based on decades of research um, in this area, that they're that they're not um, that unilateral hearing loss um, can can have a significant effect. Um, you need two ears to localize where sound is coming from. You need two ears to hear better in the presence of background noise. And so um, these children, um, I think should be closely monitored and offered some type of intervention. There are other options other than a cochlear implant um, because we want them to, um, as we've discussed, those classrooms are noisy. So it's even more challenging for those children with unilateral hearing losses. 
anything about yeah, that. Yeah, I, I just to reiterate the same thing, I think life is noisy too. Um, we're asking them in the to to learn language in a setting where we know the noise is loud. Um, and when we're doing like a speech and language evaluation and we might get them in the average range for their age, that's a quiet environment and it's one-on-one. -on -one. So that's very, it's, it's not reflective of how they are in their daily lives when they're at the restaurant or the grocery store, um, even at home, it's noisy. And I think we, as Casey said, we know more now and we can see that these children struggle when they are listening with just one ear. Excellent. Thank you again so much for your presentation. You know, I've been around these this topic uh, for a lot of years, and I always learn something new. So thank you very much. And thank you to the attendees for attending our Tuesday talk. If you could please visit our website to register for upcoming dates. And um, a, a final reminder about our available website resources. Thank you all.